Okay, we will get started. Um, and as people join in, we'll admit them into the Zoom call. And um, again, as mentioned, this session has been recorded for future purposes, so it's easily accessible at a later time. My name is Toriel Tijani, and I am your moderator for this session. And today we have with us Jack Allwile. He is a, a credentialed ASA, not fully credentialed actuary, but he has completed all of the actuarial exams and he is waiting the results of his last fellowship exam. He started out with traditional actuarial roles and he's starting to branch out of that. And most recently working on Bright House Financial's general account asset liability management team. And he was also involved in long distance real estate investing as well as other passion projects, one of which is this. He has also authored a sports analytics book, Make Better Bets, where he bet the Russian 2018 FIFA World Cup. And more recently, he's come out with 15 weeks to pass an actuarial exam a question-led journal geared towards helping students to track their progress and helping students to stay focused while they study for these very arduous exams. Um, over to you, Jack. Thank you, Tereo. Um, I, I'd like to start off just by thanking you for allowing me to speak with you all. And I'd, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. If, if you have any comments or questions along the way, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, just going to paint a picture of my experience through the exam process and uh, life as an actuary. So hopefully you get a little bit of a taste. So um, my, my first memory was I, I'm lying on my couch back at home, um, very small town in Linwood, Michigan, right on Lake Huron, we're about 100 miles north of Detroit and home to the National Pickle Festival. I, I always like to throw that in. Um, I'm 20 years old. Uh, my dad is on his computer looking up facts about this, this new profession that I've been talking a lot about. And he's like, uh, you know, wow, look, look, it looks like these people, you know, make, make a lot of money and they, they score high in all these work-life balance rankings. Now, I had just taken an interest theory class which happened to be my first night class. And it was, it was taught by an actuary by day, professor by night. And, you know, I, I really liked it. And there's a reason I think Einstein described compound interest as the eighth wonder of the world. So even though the University of Michigan had an actual science major, I had been doubling in math and econ. I, I was already a junior. I had not really considered actual work. I didn't even know what that meant. Um, but my fraternity president, president got me to take this night class with him. So in this class, our teacher discussed how he was sending his three sons all out of state for, for college. And because I was kind of oblivious to what that meant financially, I didn't really react, but all the people in the class were constantly talking about this, including my fraternity president. And that definitely caught my attention. It was brought up that the actuarial field is heavily influenced by the exam process. And while not the only factor, it, it heavily influences how far you go. And I'd say from my experience, that's fairly accurate. Um, so fellow students in this interest theory class were, I mean, very geared towards the, the money aspect of the actuarial field. And they were, I mean, looking back kind of ridiculous uh, statements, like, you know, they would be swimming in money like Scrooge McDuck from DuckTales and all, all this stuff. Um, but I just started thinking, well, you know, I've been fairly good at math exams up to this point. Maybe I should, you know, give this a go, um, whatever this is. And I, I can't emphasize this point enough. I still didn't really understand what an actuary did. What I did like was doing things that people said were hard. And this was definitely one of them. And I did consider myself disciplined, which was an attribute the professor kept bringing up in relation to the exams. The concept of getting paid to study so that you can learn important concepts that can be implied in many ways out even outside the actuarial world and then get paid more uh, the, the far you go in the exam process sounded like a great setup. I mean, some people are getting in crazy amounts of student loan debt and this is a way to study at the same time as getting paid. 
seemed like a very, very great setup. Now I will admit I did not do a great job of networking in college. I had no internships. I had gone home and tutored math and statistics in the summer on my own, played a lot of soccer. Th th those were the things I was interested in. Um, now passing the exams uh, in my little world kind of felt like I could, it was a way to compensate for the neglect I had done on my networking and beefing up my resume. That this whole idea of internships and whatnot was totally foreign to me. About 5% of my high school class went away to school and that wasn't something any of them talked about. It just wasn't in our vocabulary, our way of thinking that the whole idea of, you know, I, I need to get a bunch of good internships during school and that way I can land a good job and, you know, make, make money to support myself. Um, I did start thinking maybe I should be thinking like that. And if, if I were to pursue this, how, how should I be positioning myself? I did join the Society of Actuaries at Michigan my senior year, which I'm guessing puts some of you at better starting position than I was. Uh, now, now back to my dad. Uh, so he, he looked over his computer and said, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for you to take this, this exam. And I'll, I'll even throw in a thousand bucks if you get a nine. And he was referring to the, the probability exam, which I had actually, I had taken a probability class because, I mean, I was a math major um, my sophomore year, so a year prior. And um, I do uh, some questioning to other actuarial students, and I'm introduced to a quiz, uh, quiz and exam bank called ADAPT by Coaching Actuaries. Um, I am kind of interested if any of you, I don't know if you want to just chime in if any of you use coaching actuaries or adapt, but um, if not, I'll keep going. I certainly did with, um, I think I've used it for all of my exams thus far, so yeah. <laughs> it's familiar territory. Yeah, so I mean, I, mean I, I would say that was the single greatest tool um, I, I use during the, the preliminary exams. And I, 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 I wish there was something similar on the FSA exams. The, there's not really a substitute for that type of repetition and the, the way it's targeted towards, uh, you know, the topics on the syllabus. So, um, so fast forward a couple months attending coffee shops to study, studying ad nauseum uh, with ADAPT's help taking a complete practice exam every day for the month leading up to the exam. I, I in fact, get a nine. And uh, my, my dad gives me the thousand bucks. And, and to be honest, I mean, it's, it's the only nine I've gotten the whole, the whole time. But, but I start getting very cocky. And like, these are some, some of the things that start popping into my head. Like, yeah, this is going to be smooth sailing. Like, this, this is great. Like, I'm, I'm going to just pass all the exams and I'll make a bunch of money. And yeah, it'll, it'll be simple. So when you start thinking these things, sure enough, what, what happens on the next exam, but a big fat five. So that was the financial mathematics exam. And so, you know, looking back, so, I mean, what happened with that exam? Well, quite simply, I was cocky and didn't prepare anything like I did for the probability exam. On P, like I said, I was doing at least one practice exam per day for the month leading up. And there were many days I would do two full practice exams. So like six hours worth of prep. And for FM on this five, I think I had done like four total practice exams. So I probably, so from P to this FM, I probably pr did practice exams like 10X of what, what, what happened on this, this failed exam. And it, it kind of goes to show you that just a bit of lack of focus can really have ripple effects because that exam fail really put me into a bind. Uh, like I said, I kind of got on the actuary train a little late. I, I graduated school having only passed one exam. I get no actuarial interviews. I, I take an unrelated job in uh, Madison, with Wisconsin with um, a company called Epic. Um, uh, most of the actuarial students at Michigan uh, left school having passed two, three, sometimes four exams. And 
now at now working at Epic, you know, it, it was a good job. I was making like 40,000 a year, but I could, I, I couldn't really see the path forward. Um, and I, I think this is a very important point. It's important to be able to visual visualize where you'll be and always be thinking about the skills that you're learning and how general they are and can they be applied to other job functions? Are they translatable to other companies or industries? Um, and I, I was thinking very early that this job is, is not a fit. These skills are so specific to Epic software that I'm really only valuable to Epic. And in the back of my mind, I was still thinking about all those actuarial salary surveys that I'm sure you all have seen. Um, so I continued to study for FM uh, for you know a second go around and to, to keep this option open. And I ended up passing it in Wisconsin. Um, now I was working so much and since I wasn't getting study hours because this wasn't an actuary job, I actually had to back out of the third exam because I just, I wasn't able to get enough hours in. I felt like, I mean, I was working, uh, you know, 10, 11 hours a day, it felt. Um, so I had to back out. And then I actually just decided to quit and move back to Michigan and continue to tutor math and uh, study for the exam there. And finally, after three exam passes, um, I start getting interviews. And I finally land my first actuary job. And this is 2013. And now the starting salary was 64,000. I'm like, wow, I, I, I quit this job that I hated. I studied a little bit harder. Now I'm making over 50% more. And um, it was an interesting lesson. Um, I mean, the, the exams are in essence a weeding system. They, they try to keep people out, but you know, Back to the job, you know, so 2013, life as an actuary feels pretty good. I'm learning VBA, which uh, is a great skill and actually went into that sports analytics book that I that I made. And uh, I'm learning VBA while creating this enterprise risk management model and getting paid to study. And I'm working way less in the office compared to the Wisconsin job. <laughs> so I'm I'm getting paid a lot more. I'm kind of working less, but I, I mean, I, I'm obviously having to study a real lot, but it's, it, it's a very good balance of, uh, you know, it, it adds some flavor to your day when you get to work and study. Um, not to say it's easy, but it's, it, it makes it interesting. So, and just to give you a flavor, I, I mean, I remember finding uh, a mistake in an Excel workbook at my first job and it was about, it was about a million dollars. Um, and, and I think to myself, you know, holy cow, this is this is a huge error. And I remember showing my boss, and my boss didn't even flinch. He's like, yeah, a million dollars, okay. And I, I think that kind of shows you how much we're how much money a lot of these insurance companies are, you know, are dealing with. And just just to contrast, my my last team, part of the general account asset and liability management team, uh, just by doing some analysis we saw we could rotate out of some short, lower yielding assets um, to some higher yielding assets. And it affected the present value of distributable earnings about $150 million. So it really goes to show you that you can have a, a big impact. Um, so, 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 so back to the job, you know, I'm working hard, I'm getting paid to study. Um, and now that they're paying me to study, it feels like I have a lot more time to study and just I'm more focused and I end up passing back-to-back -back exams that year and then I just have to get through the modules and then I'm at my ASA and so and, and I kind of did the same same procedure for all the prelims um watched videos uh did um some practice and then the, the month before the exam, I would just focus on practice exams and honing in on those topics that were uh, causing me issues. Um, and th at this time, you know, I, th I thought it was smooth sailing to FSA. And sh sure enough, I was disappointed <laughs> again. So, uh, so you know, I, I moved to Charlotte, actually. My, my boss, unfortunately, had a stroke and it just, it, 
it kind of messed up the uh, rotation program. And they said I would have to stay there another two years in the same role. And I was kind of ready to rotate, uh, which is a nice, I mean, th these rotation programs that they have set up for a lot of entry level actuaries really are great. You, you get to see a lot. So I, I wanted to rotate. Um, so I moved to Charlotte uh, mid year 2015. And un unfortunately, it's kind of a turbulent situation that this company was in runoff, meaning they don't write new business. Uh, back in the financial crisis, they had some problems. And about a year in, I was already going on my third boss. The first boss had been fired. And then the second boss was rotated out. And then, and then uh, so yeah, a year in, I'm already on my third, third boss. And at the same time, you know, I'm trying to make friends in a new city and prepare for these FSA exams. And I had taken some advice from a coworker that if he were me, he would take the life risk management exam first. And as I had done enterprise risk management back in Michigan for almost three years, I, I thought that seemed like a reasonable recommendation. So I, I went with it. Um, what, one thing I realized quickly though is that most people who are taking exams are typically taking that exam as their last FSA exam. So inherently, I, I was going up against people that are further along, well, typically in their career and have more experience with these exams. And I, I don't think that should be underestimated because these exams, it, it is a slight, it's, it's, it's a skill set. Um, so I, I guess my advice on that part would be to just stick with the recommended order. Um, I mean, one, one thing I've discovered after talking to a lot of people is that just because you work in a specific department doesn't mean it's like a slam dunk when you go to sit for an exam. So if you work in the pricing department, um, it doesn't mean it's like smooth sailing when you take the pricing exam. Cause I mean, it's a very broad range of topics and um, the terminology of your company may be very different than the syllabus terminology. Um, just this last exam, even from reading to reading on the syllabus, they use different definitions of cost of capital. Um, and they were vastly different. Like the one, I remember one reading had cost of capital, capital is more of what I would have thought, I guess, more like a risk discount rate, so a percentage. And another reading used it as kind of like an opportunity cost um, of like the company, you know, doing these risky activities, they, they have to hold more in reserves um, and they kind of have to fund the percentage promise to shareholders as on their own. They have to like absorb that and it's like an opportunity cost. Um, so very different definitions. And part, part of these FSA exams is um, they don't release the grading rubric. So it's kind of, it's a little harder to prepare in that sense that there's no place that says like you get, you know, X points for mentioning Sally insurance company should look into reinsurance to lower the risk-based capital requirement or Joe PNC insurance company should start using um, conditional tail expectation instead of value at risk. Um, it, 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 there's no rubric like that. There are a lot of qualitative questions on the FSA exams, and this, this leads to some subjectivity in the grading. Um, the exam that I just took, um, the exam on valuation, has historically had the highest percentage of quantitative questions, and it's only about 40% of the exam. So I, I guess my, my, my point is the skill set from the prelims to the FSA is very different. There's a lot more compare contrast questions and critiquing arguments and statements. Um, a lot of time spent on flashcards on the FSA exams compared to the prelims. Um, so what I was initially doing on the FSA exams wasn't really working. Um, I, I was having a lot of, lot of, lot of problems passing. Uh, and after having failed um, the life risk management for a third time, uh, I, I was, I was let go. And if, uh, if you've been fired, it doesn't feel good, but, uh, perhaps it was the, the biggest blessing in disguise because it was a period for me to take a pause. Um, I traveled to Europe, many, I, I saw many of the places where my grandparents grew up in Hungary and Poland. 
And I even met my future girlfriend and now fiance actually in uh, Vienna, Austria. It, it was really a perspective reset for me. And um, I kind of just started thinking like, um, you know, why am I even doing this? Like I just from, I started reading a lot and a little bit more questioning in my own, own head going on. And uh, um, I mean, I guess if, if anyone would like to share why they actually want to be an actuary, uh, I would be interested to hear. And, uh, but if you're if not, not a big deal. Um, Jack, before that, same yeah. question about, you know, the process the discipline process and your studying process with the prep uh -huh. exam and then the um, FSA level exams. Did you find, now you mentioned the FSA level exams, they are not, you don't have the adopt the ADAPT software to assist with this upper level exams, but did you find released exam papers helpful or were there even released exam papers? So yeah, th so they do um, release prior exams so you, you do have those. They're, they're, I mean, they're only offered twice a year. So it's a limited number. And the syllabus, I would say, uh, it, it seems to change relatively frequently. So th there have been some times where from you know one sitting to the next, 50% of the syllabus turns over and you don't really have much to go off of. So it, it does make it, you're kind of having to, to guess a little bit on what they might ask. Um, now that's not to say now the company I use, the infinite actuary is, is what I've used for the FSA exams. And they, they do release some practice exams where they're actually trying to create exam that would be, um, you know, exam, exam caliber, but at the end of the day, the, the, they're also just kind of guessing, uh, you know, what, what topics might be covered. And, um, so yeah, it's, yeah, for, for, I, I guess I, I've, yeah, I've kind of struggled with the prep, um, but, but that kind of brought me to why I'm talking with you today. <laughs> um, so I guess for me, when, when I started thinking about like, you know, what's my, my why, like, why, why am I taking these? Like, it's taking up a huge amount of time. Uh, what do I want to get from it? And so if you ask me early on, uh, when my dad offered me that thousand bucks for the nine, I, I actually like, I wanted the money. Like I wanted the thousand dollars and it feels weird to say that, but, uh, and, to, and to prove I could do something hard, but that monetary high kind of leaves after a while, as you start making more money and getting more responsibility, the exams kind of become like, it's harder to stay focused and motivated. Um, and so, and I think when most people say they want like a lot of money, I mean, what they really are saying is they, they kind of want the, the freedom that comes with that money. It's not really the money itself. And I mean, there's nothing wrong if you just wanted the money. And there are people that, you know, kind of like just keeping like a scoreboard of how much, how much money they can make. And there, there are definitely people that are motivated by that. Um, but I, but I think, uh, when you start taking the time to ask yourselves those types of questions, like why do you want to do this? Um, you, you might start thinking differently. Maybe your current goal could be realized through a quicker avenue or it's, yeah, it's just maybe you're not really doing what you thought you were doing or why, you, yeah. Um, but if, but I'll say, if you don't have a strong why, the chances of you staying extremely disciplined and foc focused through these exhausting maze of exams substantially diminishes. I, I would say if you have passed one exam, if, if, you, if you can pass P, I, I truly believe you have the capability to get your FSA. Um, I've, I've met a lot of people that have um, either just not really given up, but they've just stopped taking them or you know, just ch chosen to stop or some not even get their ASA. So, but, but it's not a lack of intelligence, I would say. It's, um, you, you need to have a strong why, uh, why are, well, why do you want this? Why, why do you really want to get through all the exams? So, so I, I guess enough of that. Um, so I, you, you probably want some tips and tricks on, uh, you know, things to help you study and, 
uh, and I'll go back to this. So after my third five on that life pricing, uh, th that's really when I, I was doing some major soul searching. And I felt like I kind of lost balance in my life. And th th this, this is not just me. This, I, I know this happens to other actuaries. It's, it's quite isolating sometimes when you have to study for so many hours. Um, but you, you sometimes neglect other parts of your life. And I, I hope that people just stay balanced while they're trying to get through it. It might take you a little longer, but I hope people just try to stay balanced. But after that third five, um, I started like thinking back, like, you know, what did I used to like to do? And I used to play a ton of soccer and run a lot. And I, I, I unfortunately had hip surgery in 2014. So I hadn't played as much. And it was kind of in my head that, you know, I kind of been injured and I, I couldn't really like ramp it up a lot, but I, I had watched a video on these like ultra marathoners. And I'm like, wow, like if these guys can run a hundred miles, like even, even with a surgery, like I, I shouldn't be able to do this now. I mean, this has been year, years, years pa have passed. So, so I started training for a half marathon and I found it to be, I mean, it's very similar to a study schedule. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, just little incremental uh, progresses and they lead up to something great at the end. And I think that coupled with, and, and I was journaling about it too. And that's kind of what led to the journal I made. Um, and, I, and I felt that going through something physical and seeing progress really helped with my confidence towards all their areas of my life. And it, it really helped the studying become easier. I felt mentally more fresh and I just really felt it was beneficial. So I, I kind of harp on just trying to maintain a balanced lifestyle. Um, but back to like, let's see, tips and tricks. So, so some things that led to that seven after the three fives, I, I started um, trying to learn about memor memorizing strategies uh, because the FSA exams, there, there are like, I mean, there are syllabuses where the source material is like, you know, 2000 plus pages and you're getting asked like 10 questions on the exam. And you, you really have, you, you're like drilling these flashcards that are long lists or, and also you have all these laws that are very specific, like specific interest rates you use. And you really just have to memorize it. It's not like a lot of math that like makes sense. Like there's in a lot of these laws that they're just like arbitrary numbers that, you know, congressmen and, uh, presidents are like, you know, discussing back and forth. So there, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason. So I stumbled upon this book called Moonwalking with Einstein. And it was uh, written by a journalist that was covering memory champions. And he started implementing some of these systems himself. And he actually became a champion. I think it was like two years after he started following them, he started uh, using these same systems. And so it kind of shows you like it can be learned. And so one of the systems that, that I, I use a lot now is this mnemonic major system. And it's a way to, um, it, it gives a letter for every number. Um, so like zero through nine have a letter associated with it. And so like I started doing it with my like credit card, like, so instead of having to memorize a 16 digit credit card, you could make up four words from the four sets of four. Um, and, and just for an example, on my last exam, and like I said, some of these numbers are very arbitrary, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the tax reserves are now set to 92.81% of the stat reserves. So that seems like a totally, it's an arbitrary number. Who knows how long they, they went back and forth discussing that. But I had, I had to, I mean, a, a way to memorize that for me was I used this mnemonic system. So in the mnemonic system, I mean, th there's some variations, but what I use is, so like, so for nine, it's the letter P, for two is N, for eight is F, and for one is T. So P N F T. So th those were the, the letters I, I used and you can kind of 
uh, throw in vowels where you see fit. So the P and N, I kind of was tinkering and I was like, oh, I, I just did like Google searches. And like, I came across like Pune, India, P-U-N-E. So, okay, I was like, okay, so Pune, India, okay. And then the F-T, I'm like, okay, so fat. So that, that was the first word that came to mind. So in my mind, when I'm thinking these tax reserves, I came up with this image of this, uh, this like tax guy laying on a welcome to Pune, India sign. And that helped me memorize that 92.81%. Um, and an another example is you, you have to memorize a lot of what, what are called actuarial guidelines. And they're just numbered like actuarial guideline 23, actuarial guideline 48, um, actuarial guideline 49. And like 49 uh, with the mnemonic system, four and nine would be RP. So I kind of thought RIP, I'm kind of thinking of death while I'm, I'm reading this. So, so that, that, that helped. And that was like, that, that actual guideline is about like illustrations on index universal life, I think. Um, so it's just like ways to memorize things. Um, and then he, he also goes through this, this method that, yeah, all these champ these memory champions use called the memory palace. And it's an idea of you visualize a place you're super familiar with. And in you, you like you like are progressing through the rooms and you place things in different rooms. So it, it's, I mean, you could just see like a simple example would be if you're, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend says, you know, can you pick up lemon, salmon, and honey uh, at the store? So you might visualize yourself like walking into your home and in the first room you have a salmon like you know pouring lemon and honey on themselves and doing a weird dance and the, the more crazy the image is the easier it will be for you to to remember i mean it seems unconventional but i i've found this very helpful and actually the one of the kids on my last presentation at unc charlotte said that this joshua forward did a really good ted talk that I haven't seen yet, but I, I, I plan on looking. But he said he he basically talks through these these systems. Um, I, I found this very very helpful. Um, and like I said before, an, another thing, just you know, staying balanced, never stop exercising. Um, and uh, so let's see what else. And, and oh, and the the, the last point there. Um, the, the goal setting, I, I think this is incredibly important. They don't really teach it in school. I mean, I guess people just think you're kind of, it's kind of like obvious, like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta have goals, but like, what does that, how, how do you actually go about that? Um, because I think, um, just looking at a result of something like I want to pass the probability exam. Like I, I actually, I don't think that's a good way to structure it because, and especially on the FSA exams, they're, they're curved in such a way that, I mean, you might be more prepared on one exam and you might get a five and then you might feel less prepared on the next exam and get a six. So I, I think a better way to go about it is just think about the things you can control. How many hours you put in, that's something you can control. What, you know, what level on ADAPT do you get up to and I, I forgot the number of what they normally say is safe, like seven or, uh, but, but like, so instead of having a goal be, you know, in 105 days, I want to pass P, it, it should be more something like in 105 days, I will have amassed, you know, 350 diligent study hours and get my ADAPT level up to like 8.0. That will give me a good chance to pass P. And, and I think going through that, and be, because I think you just have to become comfortable with, you, you need to be able to separate like your decisions from the result. And I think if you can do that, you'll end up being um, just more comfortable in your preparation. And if, I mean, all, all you can do is the best you can do, right? You can prepare as hard as you can and uh, hopefully that will be enough, but th these exams are very difficult. And, um, I mean, if you go through and pass them all on the first try, kudos to you, but, uh, I don't know many people that have done that. 
Um, and there, there actually is a very good book. I, I should have added it on this. Uh, it, it's about a concept called resulting. Uh, it's taught by a um, former poker player, Annie Duke. Uh, her book is Thinking in Bets. And she, do, she does a great job uh, talking about how to separate a decision from the result. For, for example, like if you were to drive through a red light with cars whizzing by you, and make it across the to the end like unscathed. I mean, is that a good decision that you ran that red light? Like, even though it turned out good, most people would say that was probably not a good decision. But but I would imagine that if I asked a lot of you, you know, what's the best decision you made this year? Most most of you would probably throw out something that ended up with a good outcome. So people tend to look at the outcome. Uh, as the basis for whether or not they made a good decision. And I think when, when I when I started to think that way, I started to think about all my decisions like very differently. Like, you know, okay, I understand this decision that I'm about to make. Okay, in my head, it might turn out bad, you know, 30% of the time, but it might turn out great 70% of the time. And if it turns out bad, I just have to remember that before I said, you know, there, there was a 30% chance that it, it would turn out bad. So I think that framework has been very helpful and uh, it has kind of brought up some, some of my, these books that I've now uh, put out on Amazon, uh, Make Better Bets, yeah, it was about kind of assessing our betting strategy after the 2018 World Cup and kind of assessing, you know, even the bets that turned out great, did, were, did we have like, were we a little bit too exposed to certain teams or did, did we get lucky in areas that we probably didn't have business betting? And uh, so that was make better bets. The, the 15 weeks to pass an actuarial exam really came after I had prepared for that half marathon. And that's kind of when I started journaling all the time and uh, conducting like a gratitude practice every morning, you know, just, just a little bit every morning, just saying what you're grateful for. I think it, it does a good job of reframing your mind, getting some positive energy. So it's, I, I, if you would have talked to me like five years ago, I would have said this sounds pretty like wishy-washy and like, uh, you know, good, uh, feel good. And, but, but I, I really think it works. And, um, the, the journaling, just, you know, just breaking up the whole goal into smaller mini goals, like, you know, have three mini goals for today and then, uh, write them, write them in at the beginning of the day. And then at night you kind of reassess how you've done and were there any things that were preventable that you could change? Like, for example, maybe um, one of your goals was to study during lunch at work. Um, but let, let's say something came up at work and you weren't able to do it. And then you might, you might reassess and say, okay, well, I, I wasn't able to study because something came up at work. And then maybe going forward, I just shouldn't plan on studying during lunch. I should try to allocate time before work or just carve out more time after work to study and never plan on studying at work if, if that's a reoccurring theme. So it's just about getting incrementally better to help you towards you know, your ultimate goal. And um, yeah, so here's my, my contact info. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Um, I, I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. If any of you are also there, I'm happy to get coffee or tea and um, I guess my, my, if, if you want to follow any of my other stuff, I have a personal finance blog called Fire to Fire. Um, and I basically ha have learned a lot about balance sheets and income statements from keeping track of my own personal balance sheet and income statement. So I, I've learned a lot of that accounting through just accounting for myself. <laughs> and I, I think that's a great way to learn. And uh, I share all, all my numbers there. And uh, I also have a sports blog that's similar to Make Better Bets that's called the betisround.com. And uh, yeah, so if you, I mean, feel free to contact me and I, I'd love to hear some questions now if you have any. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, I really appreciated the transparency you've shown throughout this presentation with regards to 
your exam progress, the passes, the fails, the underestimating the exams yeah. and having to, you know, learning from those failures. Like those are some really, really great takeaways throughout all this. Um, for members on the call, please feel free to chime in with your questions or send them via chat. Um, so about how long have you been, and while we're waiting for that to come up, I'll just ask my questions. How long has this entire process been since when you started taking an exam till hopefully you get the results of your last uh -huh. year? Yes, like, yes. So, um, so I started so that junior year in undergrad would have been 2010, if you can believe it. The summer of 2010 is when I started. And it took me about, I think it was like five years to get my ASA I did have, like I said, I had a hip surgery. So I took off like, I think it was like five months to just focus mm -hmm. on getting my leg better. But uh, yeah, so it was, I mean, that that actually seemed pretty quick. Now I was only taking um, one exam a year because I was kind of, I was paying for them myself before I got a job. Um, so I would say if, if any of you get reimbursed for taking them, I would say, and if you're still in school, um, to take as many as you can, as quick as you can, uh, because it's, it's a lot easier to study actuarial exams while you're like in school and studying than when you're working and studying. Uh, it, it does, it does make it a little more balanced in the day, but it's, uh, it's a little more tiring. Um, ah, so, he, oh, here's a question. Sorry. I, yes. I, I just saw the, this chat open. Okay. Um, so the question says, would you say, Jack, that the exams are much more difficult than the day-to-day -day actuarial job itself? Or is it about the same? I, I, I would say the exams are harder. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's really like, I mean, it's like a weeding process and it's, it, I mean, they, they have to make the exams hard. Like I get it. It's just, it, it's, it does seem kind of sporadic, a little more sporadic on the FSA exams and the prelims. Like it doesn't seem like there's always an even distribution of questions like for a part of the syllabus, like j just for example, um, one fifth of the syllabus on my last sitting, what there was no question on the exam from this one, <laughs> this one fifth of the syllabus. So I guess someone just decided, they just decided like, yeah, we're just not, we're not going to test on this, <laughs> this, this sitting. Um, so you really, they, they kind of say, I mean, they, they this is not written anywhere, but I kind of get the sense that it's uh, more about uh, breadth, like your breadth of knowledge over depth in any one area. Whereas at, at, at your job, uh, especially with bigger companies, uh, just naturally as a company gets bigger, each job function is a little more siloed in nature. So, so you get used to doing kind of one job function. Um, I, I guess that's how I would say. Now, now, that's one of the good things about these rotation programs is you get to see different things. But at any one time, um, you're normally doing kind of like one job function. Whereas on these exams, you, you have to learn like just so much different types of stuff. It's not that any one topic is so hard. It's just that there are so many of them. It's, it's tough to keep it all, it's tough to keep it all in, in check. And <laughs> you don't get sheets like you would get with your job. You right, them. yeah. Um, another question we have is, um, given, you know, the unusual year we've had in 2020, how did you manage exam studying for the exams this year and balancing work and life versus, say, 2019? Um. Yeah, so it was, so I was scheduled to have an exam at the end of April and I, I and for these FSA exams, I really do try to hit like uh, about five to six hours a day. A after six hours, um, I, I really feel like there's like diminishing returns. Um, now, now I, I, one thing I actually didn't mention that I, that I did start doing after that third five on the life pricing exam is I kept a... Uh, a uh, uh, stopwatch, and if because what I what I was discovering was I would go to like a Barnes and Noble to study, but then I would end up like walking around a lot of the time, and like so I was I was maybe there five hours, but I wasn't really studying five hours. So what I did was 
I, I took a stop clock. And if, if I got up to walk around, I would stop it and I would make sure I got in like five real hours or I, I always would shoot for six, sometimes hard to get six, but um, I, would, I would always shoot for that. But so I was studying so hard for that April test and then it got pushed back. It got pushed back and it was kind of uncertain of when it was gonna be, they didn't announce it right away. And it ended up being middle of July so it was kind of like, you know, you're, you're training for like, like a half marathon or something, and then they just push it back and you kind of have to stall your preparation. And it did, it, it, it was tough. Um, and they had just changed the syllabus uh, uh, about, about 50%. So it was some new, new material and, you know, everyone's actually, there was only about I think so in Charlotte, there's typically around like 15 people in an FSA exam room. Um, and during this, this COVID sitting in July, I think there was six and everyone had masks on and uh, it was, yeah, it was, it just, you just have to adapt, I guess. Um, but yeah, tw 2019 was pretty straightforward. Uh, but, but 2019, um, also the, the fall 2019 was the first time I had sat for the life va uh, finance and valuation exam. And that's kind of known as like the behemoth of this track. And, um, so I, I, I was very motivated as it was my last one, but there was just so much material that I, I only got a, I think a, a three, it was on that, that, that first sitting of that exam. Um, <laughs> Big enough track. What track are you on again? Just I'm doing the individual life and annuities track. Oh, Seems okay. to be pretty common in uh, life insurance companies, but that's okay. not to say. Uh, I mean, th there there are some. There were some people at Bright House that had like the quantitative finance track, or mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's uh, marketable if you have a certain like a slightly different background because you you have a different. Uh, viewpoint and you've learned some different material you you might be able to make other connections that uh other other people wouldn't so yeah. um and i think at my first company the the way the program worked is they would allow you to take one of three tracks but m most people took the life and annuities track and that's just kind of i guess what i had thought of all along is taking but you mentioned using a, uh, the stop clock, and I have to say that I recently started doing that, and I found it so much more helpful to keep myself yeah. accountable with the hours, because it's so easy to say you budget four hours to study or six hours to study, and half of that time is on doing something completely different, so. Right, right, I, yeah, and it's, um, it's uh, I mean, it, and it, it also makes the goal, like I said, the goal, your goals need to be very specific. So, and time is one thing you really can control. So if just, I mean, I mean, I guess you, you might be more focused at one time or another, but if you put in more hours, you would think that your chances of succeeding do go up, so. So we have one more question and this is looking at, you know, you've switched companies, but I don't know if you've had experience with actuarial consulting itself. So what exposure, if any, have you had to actuarial consulting and how did you find the exam process on the consultant side? Uh-huh. So, so I, have not, I have not personally worked as a consultant. I do know many actuarial consultants though. And I guess I would say, um, I don't know if there's uh, like less emphasis. It's just that it seems like they work more hours and oftentimes they have to travel. So it seems that they have a, it, it, it kind of, when you're studying, it's good to have like a flow to get into a habit that you can keep going back to. And I feel like the people that travel a lot have a tougher time um, getting into the swing of studying, like a lot of the just traditional insurance workers um, that they don't have to do the traveling. And it, it does seem the consultants, while you may get a bigger bonus, um, you, you are also, they also expect you to, to, to work a little more, um, it, it seems. So um, 
I, I guess the, the people that I know that have like passed the exams and then gone into consulting have seemed pretty happy with that, with like uh -huh. that route. But the, the people I know that have been studying while consulting seem to have some issues, not always, but more often than not, it takes them a little longer. Yep. Um, and also one more question before, I guess we round this up. You had switched you know, companies and I wanted to ask about you, the um, exam program experience at mm -hmm. both companies. Now granted, I don't, you know, you were taking, you may have been taking preliminary exams with one company and then upper level exams with the other company, but how was the, um, the experience with the exam program at those two companies? Uh huh. I, I've kind of felt that they're pretty like standardized now. Like, like it seems like uh, going from company to company, most that I've seen or interviewed with have a fairly similar type of study program. Um, I think trying to remember, I mean, the, the hours they gave you for the prelims, I think was almost identical going from one company to the other. And then um, while I've been doing the upper level ones, it's actually been a little tough on me because I, I, I have, I had a, uh, th this general account asset liability management team is not a traditional actuarial role. So I, I, I haven't really had uh, the study hours like a normal student would, um, but they, they have given me some, but I, for the upper level ones, um, and this is a, comparing to my other buddies at other companies, it seems like 150 hours that a, a company would typ typically give you for an FSA exam. Um, and then it, it might go down 25 hours on the second attempt and another. And then after the third attempt, I think most places say you're on your own. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for taking our questions. Thank you so much for joining us on this presentation. And to members on this Zoom call, thank you again for logging in and signing up after what it must be a very long day and a very <laughs> long year. Um, I do not see any more questions coming in. Uh, we have one comment about the consultant mention. Uh, one of our members here have had a bit of experience in consulting and they find that they don't think that there's any less of an emphasis on passing and okay. so what you said, there can be more pressure in terms of working more and traveling and um, the goal of definitely achieving your billable goals. So, but she finds that she can take the study hours without an interruption. So that's okay. really good. That's great. Yeah, and that's yeah. what we definitely you, want to you got a, You've got a good company. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, Nathaniel, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Nathaniel. And this was amazing. And if you have any questions or would like to reach out or connect with Jack, please find him on LinkedIn and feel free to consider purchasing his book, 15 Weeks to Pass an Actuarial Exam. That's impressive. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Take care.